Hello friends, uh, now we will see the next strengthening mechanism, uh, already we have seen about the dislocation and point defect interaction and we looked at the solid solution strengthening and uh, some other issues when you have this kind of interactions and now we will go to another strengthening mechanism and that is related to work or strain hardening, already I have told you either it can be work hardening or strain hardening, okay, both uh, terms are equally valid. So, we want to see that wha what happens when you have more number of dislocation, how they interact, how they uh, kind of uh, strengthen the material. Okay. So, if you looked at the strain hardening, usually it is used to harden alloys, they do not respond to heat treatment. Okay. So, heat treatment we have already seen, okay, two types of heat treatment where we kind of uh, had a bulk transformation. Okay, for example, in steel we saw that from austenite you can transform to coarse perlite, fine perlite, coarse benite, fine benite or martensite. Martensite and uh, we, uh, we also discussed that martensite is very hard and uh, have very high strength. Okay, so, so you can have a hardening because of this kind of transformation or you can have precipitation as we discussed in alum aluminum copper alloy system that you can have precipitate inside the, uh, the matrix and that will add into the hardening of the uh, or increase the strength of the material. Now, the alloys which do not respond to this kind of heat treatment, for example, if you take any aluminum alloy in which uh, you have, uh, for example, aluminum magnesium alloy, so magnesium is in the solution in the aluminum okay, and uh, it does not form precipitate inside the grain. So, in th these alloys you cannot do any hardening through heat treatment. So, in this type of alloys hardening can be only done by doing a cold working. Okay. So, cold working means basically strain hardening or you want to introduce a strain in the material. Okay. And as I told you earlier also that uh, this location can overcome the pile up by doing the uh, climb process. Okay. So, if you do uh, another process called hot working which is done at high temperature, the, the at high temperature you will have more vacancies, so that this climbing process will be easy. Okay. So, when you want to do strain hardening, you have to do it at uh, lower temperatures or uh, room temperatures which is called cold working. Okay. At high temperature it is not going to be very effective. Uh, and if you see that the, with reduction of cold work, that means you introduce more cold working 10 percent, 20 percent and so on and this is the on y axis you have properties. So, you can see as I am increasing the percentage of cold work or uh, percentage of strain in the material, I, my yield strength is increasing as well as my tensile strength is increasing. However, at the cost of ductility, my elongation to failure is decreasing. Already we have discussed that the strengthening mechanism usually increase the strength, but at the cost of ductility or uh, elongation to failure. Of course, the rate of strain hardening will be is usually lower in HCP than cubic metals, okay. you because uh, in HCP metal you have only very few uh, efficient slip system. Okay. So, I will come to that that why you get the strain hardening. Okay. But uh, basically strain hardening is because when you have large number of dislocation moving at different slip systems okay, which are not parallel to each other, what happens uh, one dislocation comes and another dislocation comes okay, and they are interact with each other. Okay. So, suppose a dislocation is like coming like this, another dislocation uh, moving from some other plane okay, and it is cutting this and it is suppose like this. So, the interaction here of course, I am not going into details of how the interaction takes place because it will be another uh, uh, can be another long discussion. Okay. So, there, there is uh, something happens here when these two dislocations interact. So, one dislocation is moving in this plane, okay, another is coming out of the plane like this for example. Then there is some interaction and because of that interaction these two dislocation uh, or any one of these dislocation gets pinned, it will be difficult for it to deform, okay. you will need more stress to deform it. Okay. So, in cubic metal because you have large number of slip system which are non parallel to uh, non parallel slip system, okay. so interaction is going to be much larger 
in hcp we have only three very effective slip systems okay so the interaction is going to be smaller in them okay so that is why you have more strain hardening in cubic metals so if you look in terms of dislocation density okay uh, 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 scientist called taylor uh, in 1934 he first recognized this uh, 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 this thing that uh, if you keep on introducing a strain for example you are doing hammering or whatever you increase the strength of the material so basically if you look at the strain as a function of a strain uh, if you are plotting different uh, stress strain curve okay so you can see that this is the elastic part and then this is the plastic part and it must have fractured here so this is a stress strain curve okay now this stress strain curve uh, we are plotting after giving different percentage of coal work okay so on x axis you have a stress strain on y axis you have a stress and then in the this depth direction we are giving different percentage of elongations so suppose uh, initially i am not giving any this is as received material suppose there is no cold work then i am do, doing a 10% cold working 10% strain is introduced and 20% for example this one then 30 then 40 then 50 and so on so and uh, after each of these cold working we are doing uh, 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 tensile test okay so what you will see so you will see a tensile curve like this after 10% uh, cold working your yield stress has increased and your uts has also increased another 20 10% uh, strain okay so total 20% so yield and uh, uts has increased and so on okay so of course and ductility is also coming down as you can see that uh, in this case ductility was very high and slowly the ductility is coming down but the strength is increasing okay so if you see uh, from uh, the theoretical point of view we discuss that uh, if you don't have any dis dis defect or dislocation the theoretical strength will be very high okay uh, so around g by 2 pi so there is kind of a, a contradictory idea uh, here uh, about dislocation that we say that the, there is a drop in the strength because of defects okay the so theoretical strength should be very high but the strength uh, comes down okay or in actual strength is much lower than the theoretical strength because there are defects present in the material which are dislocation so there is a drop, drop in strength due to presence of dislocations but at the same time now we are saying that there is a increase in strength because of dislocation so if you have very few number of dislocation of course there will be a drop in the strength because of presence of dislocation okay they are free to move but if you stop them, them from freely moving okay then of course you can again increase the strength so the second part is that due to dislocation multiplication and their interaction the strength is again increasing so sometime it becomes a little bit difficult to understand and uh, appreciate uh, that one at one part we are saying that dislocation brings down the strength another part we are saying that dislocation is increasing the strength so basically idea is that if they are freely to move then of course they are going to bring down the strength if we are able to provide some uh, barrier to motion of dislocation then of course we can increase the strength of the material okay so taylor's theory is that moving dislocation interact with each other and get trapped as i told you okay trapped dislocation give rise to internal stresses that increase the stress necessary for deformation the effective internal stress tau caused by these interaction is the stress necessary to force two dislocation past each other okay so the the stress as a function of uh, dislocation density can be expressed like this okay where b is your burgers vector okay so it is dependent on the rho rho is your basically dislocation density so you can check our uh, uh, lecture on defects where we discussed about dislocation so it is dislocation is basically a line defect so it is always will be measured in some length term meter okay so this much meter of dislocation 
uh, when we are talking about this uh, the density that means this much uh, length of dislocation in this much volume of material okay so this that is what my dislocation density so both both the units are of same uh, type so i can say that these many number of dislocation per meter square okay so that is my actually density and the mean distance between the dislocation will be given by again uh, rho to the power uh, minus 0.5 so it will be uh, 1 by under root rho okay so when the density will be high the uh, the spacing between two dislocation will be small okay more number of dislocation means the spacing between the dislocation will be small so this is what is uh, the relationship between the mean spacing and the density now when we do cold working okay what we do is we introduce dislocation in the material because as, as we already discussed that is uh, the deformation okay or plastic strain is through motion of dislocation in the material okay so i need dislocation so if i give more strain in the material okay or i impose more strain in the material i need more dislocation okay that means the number of dislocation or the dislocation density will increase with the cold working with the plastic deformation for example you can have very high dislocation density of 10 to the power 11 to actually uh, 10 to the power 15 there can be a range of per meter mm square while in any structure the dislocation density is around 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 6 per mm square okay so the dislocation density can uh, go from for example 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 11 as a function of cold working okay that means dislocation generate during the deformation because for deformation i need dislocation so if i am having more deformation i need more dislocation so there has to be some generation of dislocation during deformation and this dislocation when they interact with each other they entangle with each other okay and they start forming this kind of cell walls so this is a transmission electron micrograph okay uh, at a very high uh, magnification okay and you can see that th these are all dislocation what you see these dark portions okay and it looks like a, as you can see it looks like a, a linear uh, uh, linear some uh, uh, line okay so the, all these are entangled with each other okay when they interact with each other they start forming some uh, cell wall within the grain so you can have a big grain and in in that you can form this kind of cell wall because of entanglement and so on okay about 10 percent of the energy input in cold work process is stored in the lattice okay so whatever energy we are putting through rolling process or extrusion process 10 percent of that goes into the material in the form of this dislocation so each dislocation has some strain energy associated with it okay so you can do a summation of all the dislocation to find out the total energy and that will be approximately 10 percent of the total energy which we put in in the material so rest of the energy actually dissipate in different forms some in form of heat and so on okay and some gets stored in the material in form of dislocations if you want to see the microstructure evolution as a function of a strain okay so some very precise uh, experiments people have done this is taken from a uh, paper in material science and engineering okay and they have taken the sample from different uh, part of the stress strain curve so basically what they did actually they deformed the material and stopped the deformation at this point okay and take the sample out uh, took the uh, took the sample from that uh, deformed material and did the tem micrograph or take the tem micrograph then another sample deformed up to this point another sample is taken out next sample deformed to this point then sample taken out and so on and then they saw that as a function of strain that how the dislocation density is increasing okay so initially th there is hardly any substructure or dislocation is there so the density is also shown here 
okay, what is the density at this point, then the density is increasing as a function of uh, strain okay. and uh, this is how the microstructure evolve as a function of strain in the material. Now, as I told you that when you do straining, okay, I need dislocations, okay, th so there has to be some source of dislocation, okay. uh, of course, grain boundary also act as a source sometime, okay, but one of the most important source is called Frank Reed source, okay, a dislocation source. Of course, these are two different scientists, Frank and Reed, okay, not the same guy, two people are there okay, who propose the, this mechanism almost simultaneously. Okay. Uh, so, how, uh, how you get this dislocation, uh, uh, dislocation generation. Okay. So, for, for example, this, this first stage this red dislocation is moving freely okay. and it got uh, pinned by this two defect. Okay. It can be anything, it can be precipitate or it can be anything else. Okay. So, the main idea is that the dislocation is there, okay, it is moving and it got uh, pinned by these two uh, defects here. Okay. Let us say these are two precipitates, so these are two pinning agents there. Okay. So, you are applying a shear stress tau here okay, and because of that you are producing a force on the dislocation, so the dislocation is experiencing this force F because of the shear stress tau. Okay, and the x is the distance between the uh, these two pinning particles. Okay, so between A and B, the distance is x. So of course, if x is high, okay, your force will also be uh, higher. So I am applying a shear stress here. Because of that, now you can think of this as a as a, a, a bow and arrow kind of thing. So you your bow is uh, fixed on one end, and then you are stretching it. Okay. So when you are applying a force, it will get stretched uh, between these two pinned points. Okay. So it will become uh, from a straight line, it will become a curved surface like this. So this is at first stage. Okay. The, this dark blue color is the second stage okay. and then it will start getting bowed out like this. So, this is my third stage. Okay. Then what will happen is to reduce the energy of the dislocation, okay, it will like try to get a spherical uh, or a circular geometry. So, basically it, it will try to get a geometry like this. Okay. Now, what will happen that these two ends of the dislocation have uh, opposite uh, sign or opposite Berger vector. Okay. So, how, uh, the one contain the upper half plane, the another contain the lower half plane. Okay. So, they have a opposite sign. Okay. So, when they come very close to each other, the, the two dislocation attract each other okay, and they, they will annihilate uh, each other. Okay. So, what will happen is that at this local point, so this is my fourth stage, okay. basically it has annihilated each other okay. and now you will end up with a, with a dislocation loop. Okay. So, this is my fifth stage okay. and again the remaining part will go here. Okay. So, the remaining part will remain here between the two pin particle and you have a, a, a loop which is already generated and this dislocation loop will move. Okay, and the animation is shown here that how this takes place. So, you start with this and then this is uh, kind of joined together and you, you end up with a loop and then another cycle of uh, same thing starts happening. Okay. So, this is how we generate dislocation in the material. But if you do the annealing, okay, what will happen when you do annealing? You take the material to high temperature. Okay, so, at high temperature you will have more vacancies. Okay, so, uh, basically at high temperature, so more vacancies, vacancies, equilibrium vacancy concentration will increase vacancies. Okay. Then you will have more climb process, dislocation climb. Okay, so, if you do a dislocation climbing, okay, what will happen? The dislocation will disappear from the grain okay, because it keeps on climbing and then it will be absorbed into the grain boundary. So, what happens when you have annealing actually the dislocation density reduces 
okay as you we, we told you that uh, for a cold work material it can be 10 to the power 1 11 per meter square for annealed sample after annealing it can be as low as 10 to the power 4 per meter square okay so if annealing reduces the dislocation density and because of that uh, basically the strain in the material also reduces okay and as I, we told you that when you do any cold working or strengthening the ductility comes down strength increases so if i do annealing i can restore the uh, ductility okay so this is a very important me uh, mechanism in the sense that i can keep coming back to my original position Okay, so I strengthen the material. If I think now it is a, it is a, has very low ductility, I can do an annealing and restore the property. So that is a very important uh, thing with any material that I can always go back to my original position. Okay, by doing some another uh, kind of uh, processes. So annealing can be divided into three distinct processes. One is recovery, which is actually actually related to this, the climbing process. So dislocation recovery. Okay, so dislocation gets recovered. Then another process is called recrystallization, and then you have a process called grain growth. So all these three processes are shown here. Okay, so recovery is restoration of the physical properties of the cold work metal without any observable 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 change in the microstructure so there is no observed change in the microstructure microstructure is will look more or uh, more or less similar but the there will be recovery of dislocations okay so you will be uh, you can get a restored microstructure so if you see in terms of tensile strength the tensile strength will drop if you do a recovery process but the ductility will increase okay so up to this you have a recovery process so in the microstructure suppose it, this is a cold uh, rolled microstructure elongated grains then you you will see elongated grains only okay because only the dislocations have recovered so there is there is not going to be any visible change in the microstructure recrystallization basically these strained grains uh, will get a new set of grains which are strain free Okay, so, when you have very high uh, strain energy because of the high dislocation density, my material wants to go to low energy by nucleating new strain free grains okay, and these grains will grow and consume the whole material. So, the cold work structure is replaced by a new set of strain free grains, hardness strength decreases but ductility increases. So, in this case also the strength can decrease. Uh, it depends upon the size of the grain okay and ductility will improve okay so not necessarily always that this strength will decrease okay then grain growth occurs at high temperature where some of the recrystallized fine grain is start to grow rapidly grain growth is inhibited by precipitate spinning uh, precipitate spinning the grain boundary okay so if i do this uh, fine recrystallized grain if i do further annealing at high temperature what will happen this uh, grains will grow okay so basically the bigger grain consume the smaller grains okay so it is like a, if you remember the soap bubble kind of analogy where if you have a small bubble and if you have a bigger bubble and you join them together okay so the smaller bubble will shrink and the bigger bubble will grow okay if you remember your high school physics same thing will happens here also that smaller grains will shrink and bigger grains will grow and overall if this uh, process is taking place then there will be overall increase in the grain size of the material. So after cold working this is some three very important processes which takes place in the material if you do any annealing process okay it can be you can do a recovery or you can do a recrystallization or you, you can have a grain growth process. Okay, so, with that thank you, so we have covered a very important strengthening mechanism which is cold working and that you will see very often for example, if you see roadside some blacksmith is there, he is uh, hammering the, the material, okay, basically he is trying to increase the strength of the material by doing a hammering process. Okay. So, this is one of the very important strengthening mechanism, thank you.